We're starting a brand new series uh, today, and it's called The Success Code Declassified. So you want to get your notepads ready, buckle your seat belts, and hang on. It's going to help you, I'll tell you. Uh, how many remember the movie National Treasure? There were two of them, I think. But uh, actually, they found a secret code on the back of what? Declaration of Independence. On the back, they found numbers, which they called a cipher. And so it was going to show them a way. And of course, the whole movie wraps around all these clues, and they end up in a cavern full of what? Gold. I mean, a massive amount of treasure. Wouldn't it be great to find a real treasure map? Kind of like the one behind me on the screen. The treasure map says there could be a silver coin under your seat. That's what it says, in case you don't see it. But it wouldn't be cool if you really had a treasure map that told you where the treasure was at. Everyone would be happy about that, wouldn't they? That'd be awesome. <laughs> I do this quite often to teach lessons here. All right, where is it at? Where is it at? Where is it at? You may have to get up and search a chair next to you, but there's one somewhere. That back set, this, that, over that session over there. You guys are lazy or what? Look for your coin. I mean, this whole group's going to come storming over there in about five seconds. Okay, Holly, just grab it. We're out of time. <laughs> Bring it back. You, I get to keep it. We tried. You can give it to me after service. Gosh. They didn't believe you. The lesson was, here was the obje object, <laughs> is that you believed it was there. You believed me, so you went and searched for it. You failed. This whole message means nothing now. I just I start over. <laughs> well, the other service found theirs anyway. All right, let's move on. Anyway, if you had a map that showed you where the treasure is, you would be sure to go after it, I'm sure, right? Yes, uh, you had a chance to redeem yourself right there. But uh, <laughs> this is a true story. Back when we started the church, back in the warehouse days, we had a couple there of farmers uh, they're, uh, and they had a business on the side. Their business was not doing well, and they were facing sheriff sale, their foreclosure. And, of course, they were praying about it, and uh, it didn't look good. Came up to about two days away from the foreclosure, and he said, well, there's nothing else I could do. I just, you know, they were remodeling an old farmhouse that had the old plaster walls, plaster ceiling. And he said, well, I just went back to working on the living room, he said. I, I've already tried everything. There was no way out. And so... As he was on a ladder, tearing the plaster out of the living room ceiling, he happened to hear a big clunk on the floor behind him. He looked behind him, and there was a wire mesh purse full of old coins. Took the old coins down to Allen's Coin Shop, that's here in Columbus, and asked them what would they be willing to give you know, him for the coins. The man said, Mr. Allen's not here today, so I'm unable to offer any more than this amount. I think the amount to get out of sheriff's cell was maybe like 2,500. This is back in the 90s. And uh, he said, I'm only authorized to give up to 2,500. And, and the, the, the guy in our church said, that's basically what I need. And he said, I'll take it. And he goes, well, don't you want to know what the coins are really worth? He goes, I don't want to know what they're worth. Today, they're worth the farm. True story. And so it'd be great if you had access to a treasure chest, right, to solve your problems. The issue is that you, you do have access. The real, the real issue is you have a treasure chest. I'm going to help you understand that. Let's begin our study today in Luke chapter 5, verse number 4. It's a story you've read many times, but I want to point something out. We'll begin in verse number 4. When he had finished speaking, that's Jesus, he said to Simon, that's Peter, okay, just give you a clue here, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Peter answered, Simon, uh, Master, we've worked hard all night, haven't caught a thing, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. Now, you've heard me mention this many times, 
that this is a picture of the kingdom. The earth curse system laboring all night, hoping to catch something, hoping to survive, or the kingdom more than enough, a lot more than enough, right? That's what the kingdom looks like. That's what you're looking for in the kingdom, right? That's, that's what it looks like. So let me ask you a question. How did they catch the fish? How did Jesus catch the fish? You need to be able to answer the question. Now, remember, Jesus set aside his former glory, the Bible says. He is ministering as a man anointed by the Holy Spirit, the same as you. So let me ask you a question. How did the fish show up? Because if you can't explain how they showed up, you'll not be able to duplicate it. So let's look for some clues. We're spiritual scientists, right? Once you have an understanding, these stories are illustrating kingdom laws that you have access to. You need to think different. How did they show up? Okay, so we know right away that Peter, the business, James and John, were partners from the story. Jesus needing a boat to preach from, to get back from the crowd so he could speak to them, borrowed the boat. Or let me put it in different terms. He borrowed the business. Now, you know from being at Faith Life a long time probably that what happened to the business at that moment spiritually, it changed jurisdiction. It came out of their jurisdiction. They voluntarily placed it under the kingdom of heaven's jurisdiction, which gave heaven the legality to do what? Download a word of knowledge to Jesus where the fish were. Now, you remember I've told you this many times. Anyone can catch fish if what? If Jesus tells you where they're at and how to catch them. So a word of knowledge is also, if you remember, one of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit given to the church. That'd be you, by the way. The words of knowledge. It's activated by faith. Peter said, I will because you said so, which gave heaven legality when it changed kingdoms, jurisdiction, and a word of knowledge was given to Jesus. All right, so that's number one. Your number one asset in your success code, of course, is the Holy Spirit. Uh, the book of John calls him your counselor, and that is your answer, the Holy Spirit. Number two, and number two is where we're going to focus at today. Let's finish the story, verse number seven. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full they began to sink. Now we went a whole other level. We had nets breaking in the first part. Now we have two boats sinking. Wouldn't it be great if the shocks in your car gave out going to the bank? <laughs> Can't care anymore. <laughs> That'd be pretty awesome. But that's what heaven looks like. That's what the kingdom looks like. But let me ask you a question. How thrilled do you think James and John were that day that Peter was a partner in their business. Think they're pretty happy about that? Remember Peter said, because you said, I will. Peter's, now understand this, James and John exercised zero faith in that harvest. Remember the harvest is already there. Peter asked them to come help him gather it. So why did their boat almost sink when they exercised no faith? Because they were partners. A lot of spiritual truths in this story that you can learn, but the bottom line is, is that Peter's faith brought the harvest. They helped. All right, so I imagine they're pretty happy about that, right? Man, we're glad we got Peter on board today. That's an awesome story. So today's lesson, that's all in, uh, just introduction. Today's message is, who are you following? Success code declassified. Who are you following? Luke chapter 6, verse 40 says this, The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Will be like their teacher. Not maybe. They will be like their teacher. To illustrate this, let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse number 1. This story occurs after David had killed Goliath. Saul is very upset and jealous and is trying to kill David. And so we pick the story up here in the 22nd chapter, verse number 1. David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. All those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him, 
and he became their leader. About 400 men were with him. So let's, let's stop and analyze this. So they heard of what? It said they, they heard about it. What did they hear about? Help me out. I already told you what just happened. They heard about David killing Goliath, right? So his family and friends and all these people gathered around David. I need to ask a question. Why did they gather around him? He did not open a new office down at the cave leadership clinic. In fact, David was a shepherd. He wasn't even a leader. He was just a shepherd. Now, why did they gather around him? Because they saw what happened. So many people chase after titles, but you, you want to make sure you're following demonstrated results. Because you'll become exactly as those you follow. They gathered around him because he had results. It wasn't a title. It wasn't a degree. It wasn't a new office opening. It wasn't a glittering web page. It was he had the results. He had the goods. They needed help. So let me say something else. Why did they gather around him? Let's pick up another clue that's vital to your life. In 1 Samuel 17, let's just go back a couple chapters. Verse number 8 through 11. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? He said, I'm, Am I not a Philistine? And you're not the, are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come to him. Now remember, Saul was the king, King Saul. If he's able to fight and kill me, we'll become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you'll become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man, let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, King Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Write this down. If the king's fearful, there are no answers. Let's listen to what David said, though. Remember, David heard Goliath ranting and raving and went to King Saul and offered that he would fight Goliath. 17, verse 36 through 37. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Because he has defied the armies of the living God, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Notice, David is basically saying, wait a minute, guys, he has no covenant. We have covenant. I have a covenant with God. He has no covenant. He's putty in my hands. Do you understand? I have a covenant. He does not have a covenant. Now, there was a great reward, if you read the story in the Bible, uh, that the king was going to give to whoever took Goliath out. Number one, great wealth. How many here would like great wealth? I don't believe you. None of you moved. (laughs) Great wealth's not a bad thing. Uh, His daughter in marriage was more than just a wife. That gave him access to all the benefits of the entire kingdom, right? Number three, his family would be exempt from taxes. That's pretty good stuff, right? Now, let me ask you, that reward was available to every person there. Wouldn't you agree? Every person there, including the king, had the same covenant David did. Absolutely. Then why didn't one of them stand up and volunteer? And this is the point I want to make, and it's going to make a point for your life as well. They were corrupted. You will take on the spirit of who you follow. The entire army was subject under Saul. Saul was terrified. Now, fear is a contagious thing, and so is faith. Saul's fear and lack of leadership corrupted the entire army so that not one of them had the courage to stand up against Goliath, although they had the same covenant and the same reward was offered to them. Amazingly, God had to bring a shepherd out of the back hills to take on Goliath. Pretty amazing story, isn't it? Pretty amazing. 